Well, good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Seth Pickering. Uh, I work for the Department of Energy Resources here in Massachusetts in the Green Communities Division. Um, we're here tonight to share information uh, with interested citizens here in Carver uh, about uh, the Green Communities Program and how it might be able to benefit Carver. Um, and one of the requirements uh, that Carver will need to fulfill um, and have a town meeting vote on is a, a warrant article for uh, the stretch energy code. Um, so uh, we're here tonight to provide some detail on what the stretch code is and what it's not. Um, Mike Berry is here. Um, he is a technical expert uh, from ICF International that um, the Department of Energy Resources uses to come out and um, help out with these types of presentations. He will be doing most of the presentation here, but um, we'll get you started. Uh, the Green Communities Designation and Grant Program um, can provide up to um, $20 million uh, per year in um, uh, energy um, efficiency um, funds for uh, qualifying communities. Uh, and the funds uh, come from uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative auction proceeds and from alternative compliance payments from um, the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Uh, there are five criteria um, that each city and town need to uh, adopt uh, to become designated as a green community. Carver has actually done a few of these already. Um, and so the one that we're going to talk about tonight is criteria five, the stretch energy code. Just as a little bit of background, um, on Monday night, Duxbury voted to um, adopt the stretch code. So now we are up to 190 municipalities um, out of 351 uh, here in Massachusetts are currently uh, operating under the stretch code and it constitutes over 65% of the population here in the Commonwealth. There are 185 green communities that have been designated to date. Uh, we have granted over $67 million uh, since 2010. Um, to help all the communities that you see here with energy efficiency related projects. So we're going to let Mike take over here and he's going to go into um, his presentation on the stretch code. Thanks, Seth. Um, if it's okay with folks in the audience, um, I'm going to go through the slide deck and a after the slide deck, if you can hold your questions to the end, some of your questions may be answered in the actual presentation, but if there's something I miss, something you want me to go back over, please uh, ask me at the end of the presentation. I'm happy to answer. Um, we're also very fortunate we have a building code official in the room tonight. Uh, we have also have two HERS raiders in the room, so when we've talked about HERS raiders, if there's questions pertinent to the building code that I can't answer or to HERS ratings in general, uh, we've got some folks in the room that can definitely talk about that. Yeah, so my, my mistake, I meant to uh, introduce uh, Jim Merritt is here. Uh, Jim is uh, the building inspector in the town of Kushnet. Um, and so uh, when the presentation is over, uh, if you have questions about how um, the stretch code works as a practical matter um, through the inspectional services in town, uh, he'll be glad to answer your questions. Putting Jim on the spot. <laughs> um, so criteria five for the Green Communities Program is mainly focused at minimizing life cycle costs. And this is looking at how homes operate as a system, really focusing in on long-term um, uh, long term survivability of a home, but also long-term cost. How much is it going to cost you to heat and power that home over the lo long term uh, of someone living in there? And also looking at things like wa water conservation, um, renewable energy, things like that. But the big thing that we're going to focus on when we talk about Criteria 5 is energy efficiency. We're primarily looking at how we can conserve more energy so we can stay in our houses longer. Criteria 5 um, requires new buildings in towns to be more energy efficient. Um, it, I was not part of the presentation or the discussion, but I know that several towns, including Carver, had looked at this stretch code years and years ago. Um, the presentation you probably heard, or, or when it was brought up to you, was about a stretch code that was really a stretch. 
was truly a lot different than the current base code that you have today in your town or you had back uh, a couple of years ago. Um, you're gonna hear me use those terms, base and stretch code. So a base code is the code you have today and all the other towns of the non-190 that have the stretch code uh, have as their energy code. Uh, the stretch code is, as Seth mentioned, is um, adopted by towns through the town meetings or city councils um, it's an appendix to the building code. Um, so when we used to do these presentations, people would say, you know, it's, it's not actually part of the code. It, it's, it's a, it doesn't give us a unified building code here in Massachusetts. It's part of the code. It's just up to a town whether they want to adopt it. Um, the big focus of the stretch code is it looks at performance instead of the prescriptive codes. So there's two ways you can build homes here in Massachusetts. You can build them prescriptively, which means you follow the code. The code will tell you how much insulation to put in, what type of windows. It will tell you exactly how to build a home. There's another way you can do it, which is the performance path. And we're going to focus primarily on that because that is what towns are adopting when they adopt the stretch code. They're adopting to only build using the performance path for new construction only. So again, um, the code that we talked about many years ago affected um, renovations, additions, and new construction, the code, stretch code that we have today is only affects new construction. So renovations and additions. What? New residential. Yeah, new residential and new commercial. Um, it, it only focuses on, on new construction and where the renovations and additions would default back to the base code. So, um, so some of the misconceptions with the stretch code is that the stretch code is new and experimental. Well, we've had the stretch code now for um, going on seven years. Um, and so we've got 190 communities that have now adopted it. So we really have gotten some feedback about what worked and what didn't work. And that's what drove the new stretch code that came in on January 1st to look at a code that would basically make it easier for builders to understand that the code's the same in Carver, Today, that you would adopt the stretch code, the only difference is, is the removal of the prescriptive path for new construction. So again, only focusing on, on performance construction with new, uh, newly constructed buildings uh, for residential and commercial. Um, that towns would give up local control of their uh, codes because you were working with a code that wasn't the statewide building code. And again, it's part of the statewide building code. It's part of this, the, the actual um, uh, building code here in Massachusetts. It's Again, it's an optional code that towns can adopt and as mentioned, 190 have. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions is that town residents would have to update all their homes. So only time that you would end ever need to do anything that revolves around the stretch code is if you're building a new residential home or a new commercial building. And those are buildings in excess, commercial buildings in excess of 100,000 square feet. Uh, I mentioned earlier, additions and renovations and repairs don't apply to the stretch code. You default back to the code you currently have here in town today, which is the base energy code. So, um, a lot of people were concerned early on that, well, what happens if I want to do a new kitchen? I heard I had to bring my whole house up to meet this code. Again, the only thing the stretch code affects is new construction. So um, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions we had starting way back in 2010 when I first started doing these. And to, to today with the new stretch code that we have and we're talking about tonight is that it only focuses on new construction. Um, I, I can say with the misconceptions that I've done um, 116 stretch code presentations in seven years of doing this work uh, for the Department of Energy Resources, so I've heard it all. Um, I've also been to a lot of towns on that map that have adopted, um, and I've also been, I've been in great communication with folks after the fact. So we tend to build really strong relationships with the towns that adopt and also can support them. And your building code official in town has gone through trainings to actually learn about the stretch code. It's part of their training uh, curriculum. Um, the stretch code is no longer a stretch. I mean, compared to the code that we had back um, in 2010 when um, the stretch code first came uh, uh, into play with communities, um, it was based on a code that was two cycles ahead. 
So towns that were adopting early on, like Newton and Cambridge, who were early adopters in 2010, were adopting a code that you wouldn't see for two more cycles. What we did on January 1st of this year when the new stretch code came in is we wanted to make it the same as the base code, but with the removal of that prescriptive path with an emphasis and focus on performance path construction. So what we did was we started to look at the fact that the stretch code would still be a stretch for communities to just build through the performance path. But the other thing is that we're seeing now more performance path um, guidelines put into the code anyhow. So when I'm doing these presentations, most likely either a builder, builders are not, builders are nomadic. They don't tend to work in one town. So a majority of builders have either worked in a stretch code community, maybe built a home to the stretch code. <coughs> More importantly, when we did this early on, was the big, the big um, difference for builders was that they never worked with what we call a HERS radar, a home energy radar. HERS radars are now part of the construction practice. So if you were to build a home today in Carver, a new home, you're most likely working with a HERS radar because they're gonna do what they call infiltration testing and duct testing. So when we were doing this before, builders may have never worked with a HERS radar. Now they're part of the building practice. Again, the big difference is that emphasis on the performance construction, which utilizes a HERS radar to not only do those, that infiltration testing and that duct testing, but to also do what, what we call an energy model. I'm sorry to interrupt you. May I? Yeah. May I use the mic? Sure. I know it's been a long time for me, but there, there may also be people here. You're using language that may not be understood, so you might need to explain hers okay. and performance, okay. because I'm not sure what you mean by performance, okay. a performance path. Yep. I'll get into that in a, on a future slide, but thank you. Um, yeah, I, I will actually cover what a HERS rating is and and what the performance path is and a HERS rater and the role that they play. Um, but again, feel free to ask me more questions as I go on and afterwards as well if I don't hit it. Uh, I don't hit, hit what you're asking about. So the big difference with the new stretch code that was adopted on January 1st of this year is that we focused on new, new construction of residential and commercial buildings and with an emphasis on the performance path. And we focused on that because, again, I mentioned that these home energy raters, and, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a little bit more depth in, I think, the next couple slides, um, there was an added cost to working with them. So when we were doing these presentations in the past, people were concerned about that because that was an, an added cost to construction for stretch code communities. And again, builders are now working with HERS raters to do this testing that's now required by the code. So the cost is still, there's still a cost to it, but it's a cost that's also being paid for now as part of the regular building practice. So what does the stretch code apply to? It applies to the same things that the base energy code here in Massachusetts in the code you have today in Carver. It, it's applicable to insulation, doors and windows, lighting, mechanical equipment, building tightness, uh, and with some renewable energy if someone's interested in installing it. So why do we test for performance and what is the performance path? So the Code today in Carver, the building code you have today, you can build a home two ways. You can build it through the prescriptive path, as I mentioned before, and the prescriptive path is following the code as it's written. So it's gonna tell you what type of insulation and how much you're gonna put into it, what the windows you have to install, and you have to do what they call a minimum. So you're actually building a home to the minimum part of the code. You have to meet each one of those sections where the performance path, which is the other option builders have, um, tests for performance, which means that you have what they call trade-offs. You don't have to build by what the code says, you build by what the energy models say. So you're basically looking at a house as a system. You're looking at how the heating equipment, any cooling equipment, lighting, insulation, windows, orientation on a lot, all that factors into how a home performs. So this, I always equate this to having a car and having, uh, and having to have a new motor put in it. You get a motor and you get it out of a crate, you drop into a car, it's probably not gonna run right, 
it's the right motor, it's put in, it's exactly what it should be and it's probably hooked up correctly, but you actually have to do some diagnostic testing, you have to make sure it's performing optimally, you have to make sure everything's working correctly. So performance testing and the performance path is a focus on how a host works as a system and you don't have to follow the code you don't have to put in like a certain type of insulation level. You don't have to put in a certain type of window uh, value. You can you can pick and choose. So they call them trade-offs. You do this because you're working with a home energy rater. A home energy rater is the person who sits down, takes your building plans, runs them through an energy model, and based on that energy model, they can tell you if you're meeting the performance path. I'll get into the how that's met and what the target is in, in another slide, but so the biggest thing with performance path is you're testing a home's performance, not just how it meets the code by each of the set requirements. Did that answer the performance path of oh, the prescriptive? Okay. Um, so the HERS rater test, and it's not that the prescriptive code's not good, the prescriptive code's good, but what it doesn't test for is the performance. It doesn't make sure that the, in, the measures that were installed were installed you know, perfectly and that there's no gaps in construction. Gaps in construction can cause things like ice damming, which a lot of people have, where you have heat leaking into spaces we don't live, like attics, melting ice, and then it's refreezing and, and causing water damage. Something like that is actually caused because there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a missed opportunity in construction that if we just follow the prescriptive path, we may not hit those things. With performance testing and the performance path, we're actually looking for those areas to make sure we're sealing houses up properly, we're ventilating them right, which is very important, and we're also maximizing our personal investment, our money, to make sure that we're getting the best bang for our buck because the home's being built properly. The HERS Raider role is they're a third party verifier. So they're not the code official, they're not taking anything away from the code official, they're actually the person who's actually doing the verification to make sure that the home meets the standard of the performance path. So for the prescriptive path, for the base code, you don't have to use a HERS Raider to do the to do the energy modeling, but you still have to use them for the ventilation testing and, I'm sorry, the infiltration testing and the duct testing. So, a home energy rater uses what they call the home energy rating system, or HERS, and the home energy rating system, you see that scale on the left-hand side. Uh, I know it's tough to see, but that scale at the very bottom of it goes to zero and then beyond, and it goes as high up it, I think on that one it goes as high up as 140 or 160. A HERS rated using energy modeling software will actually put your plans in and somewhere based on your plans as you wanted to build your home, you're actually gonna fall onto that scale. To be compliant to the energy code, to the stretch code and the performance path of the base code, you have to be at a HERS 55. So you have to be probably about, uh, right about midway, a little further midway down, maybe about three quarters of the way down there. As you move down that scale, you're moving to what they call net zero housing. So net zero homes use as much energy as they put back into the grid. So homes way up on that scale. My house on the Cape was built in 1830 when I first bought it. It was way up on that scale. I did a, I did a energy model of it and is it still? Yeah. Um, I did an energy model of it. I was way probably beyond where that scale goes. Um, I ins insulated it. I air sealed it. I put better windows in. I really kind of made a difference. I moved down that scale by 30 points. What does that mean? It means my house out of heat with oil. I was going to three tanks of oil I, during the winter. I'm now down to a tank and a half. So I could tell that the, what I was doing to my house, the changes I was making was actually saving energy and I can actually do that by seeing by the energy model. I could actually go through and pick and choose what I wanted to do and how I could actually um, make my house perform better. Uh, oops, I skip over. This thing is wicked sensitive. Yeah. Um, I'll touch a little bit about the commercial stretch code, but typically in towns that are looking to adopt the stretch code, the commercial code is not a really big deal. The reason why I say that is because the commercial stretch code only is affects new construction of buildings over 100,000 square feet. Typically those buildings, you're working with an energy modeler and an energy modeler can drive down consumption. So to meet the code, you have to be 10% better than the commercial building code. And to be honest with you, when we talk to commercial developers, 
they kind of shrug it and go, yeah, we can do that. That's easy. Um, applies to buildings, again, newly constructed buildings over 100,000 square feet and labs, some where, warehouse spaces and supermarkets as well, um, over 40,000 square feet. Again, typically not a big deal for towns that are adopting and not a barrier is the commercial stretch code. Um, the stretch code requires builders to provide documentation to the building code office. So the building code official does not lose any of their um, um, so what I'm looking autonomy. For. Yeah, autonomy or they, they're, they're still doing the same inspections that they're, they were doing before. What the HERS rater does is the HERS rater is providing this documentation based on the energy modeling to show that the home meets the stretch code and also that it, it meets it upon final performance testing. So when a home's done before it receives its certificate of occupancy, HERS Rater goes out, does their testing, puts all that information back into the energy modeling software, and then hits enter, and that tells whether or not you're compliant to the code. Typically, I used to have this question asked me all the time, what happens if you're not? HERS Raters are involved during the whole building process. So they're doing energy modeling, when it's a house of the house is just a set of plans they're coming out during the midpoint they're doing midpoint inspections they're probably coming out several times to meet with the builders the subcontractors to make sure the house is being built properly um, for large for commercial buildings it's basically the same process you have an energy model you have um, inspections and you have basically a final submittal that just says that you're compliant to the code um, in a town like Carver, um, there's incentives through Mass Save for builders building homes. So there's um, a lot of money that builders can tap into. And again, this was a misconception early on. Builders didn't think that they could get this money. They can actually apply for it and offset some of the costs. So when I get into some of the cost analysis um, at the end of this presentation, what's factored in the cost analysis is these, these incentives. So builders can get money through the utilities to work with HERS raters, um, put in high efficiency heating and hot water equipment, um, add in cooling equipment, and they get free lighting, uh, which is really important right now because the code requires high efficacy lighting. So basically, builders can get the lighting they need for free. Yeah, Eversource Town. Uh, yeah, because you're yeah because you're an Eversource community um, that makes you eligible to tap into MassSave. Um, there's incentives for commercial buildings. There's a lot of them, I'm not gonna get into them. The reason why there's a lot of incentives for commercial buildings is because if you've ever drawn, driven up 128 or down 128 outside of Boston, on a Saturday at night, every one of those buildings that's completely unoccupied is lit up like a Christmas tree. So the utility companies put a lot of incentive dollars towards commercial buildings because there's a lot of, ab there's a lot of uh, ability for them to save energy. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cost analysis. Um, this here, and it, again, I apologize, it's tough to see from where you guys are, and um, I think they're recording this, so you might be able to see it again uh, closer, and I think some folks actually printed out the, the presentation. Um, what this basically shows is a, a house in Worcester, it's 2,200 square feet, it's three bedroom, it's electrically heated. We're seeing a lot of electrically heated homes here in Massachusetts now because they're installing things like, they call them air source heat pumps and heat pump hot water heaters because they're very efficient. There's also a lot of utility money to incentivize the use of this equipment. What this shows is a home that was originally um, if built to the base energy code, so the code you have today in Carver, would meet what they call a HERS index of a 57. So basically, to be compliant to the stretch code, you have to be out of 55. So this house, to the base code, so if you were building today, this home, you would be only two points from where you need to be for the stretch code. That's why the stretch code is no longer a stretch. Um, what you see on the right-hand bottom side of that is if the builder or homeowner invested $2,066 into their home, that would get them to a HERS index of 49. So it actually gives them six points from below being compliant to the stretch code, but they got back $4,793 in utility incentives. So basically, they were cash positive after they got their utility incentives, um, 
by two thousand seven hundred dollars. The estimated reduction on energy cost on this house was um, I don't my glasses three hundred sixty seven is that five hundred sixty seven thank you five hundred sixty seven dollars a year. Um, which is a whopping $273 difference to their down payment. Uh, it adds $141 to their annual mortgage payment. It's less. It's less, yeah. In parentheses. Yeah, yeah it's, I'm sorry, it's less. Actually, anything in parentheses. I'm sorry, that's right. It's, 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 it's less $141. And basically, this house in year one, you're saving $1,000 right off the bat. In year two, you're saving $700. What this speaks to, again, when we were out here, or when you guys were talking about this many years ago, the cost to meet the stretch code was substantially higher because, again, it was two codes away. Now that the stretch code and the base code have, a, have aligned and are, are very similar, the costs have gone down. Added to that, the utility incentives, because you guys are in Eversource service territory, makes this a, a lot easier for folks to absorb these costs up front. But let's also just, if, if you look at this, what this story it's telling is about a home that actually is gonna perform better over the long period, again, going back to those life cycle costs. We're looking at how a house is gonna perform for the life of the home. And as one thing we know is energy costs probably are not gonna go down, they're gonna go up. And as they go up, this home, the initial investment of that $2,066 is gonna be an investment, a very wise investment made. This is a similar um, one as well, but this is gas heat. Um, and you'll see that the estimated cost was about $2,017 to meet the stretch code. Um, there's utility incentives there, about $2,000, so it pretty much is a wash right off the bat. The reason why you're also seeing that um, the cost is similar to the electric home and the utility incentives are a bit lower is because Believe it or not, there's a, I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of incentives out there to put in these air source heat pumps, these electric air source heat pumps, and for hot water equipment. Um, there's not as much incentives now for like gas-fired heating equipment and hot water. They've come down considerably. So what this basically tells the story is that when we used to again do this, a misconception was, well, we heard that the only way you can meet the stretch code is if you have access to gas heat. Or gas gas heating equipment and this actually tells a story that a home that he heats with electricity can easily meet the stretch code and exceed it where the gas house can do the same but it's not it's not as um, the cost the cost and utility incentives are, are pretty much lower than what you would if you did an electrically heated home um, um, I'm not gonna get in this slide because this is real difficult to see from a distance, but this is how it breaks down, um, how you actually break, how you actually meet the stretch code. So, do we have any builders in the room? No. So, builders. Yep. This one over here. Little builder. <laughs> so you've you've done res check before. Oh, okay, so um, builders right now in your town most likely are using a thing called ResCheck, which I'm assuming all base code communities are still using. ResCheck allows you to see if you're compliant to the base code, make sure that you're meeting the energy code, and it's basically a form builders fill out that says you add in all this information, what kind of insulation you're putting in, what kind of windows, and it says you're compliant to the code. Um, with ResCheck, when you use this ResCheck form, you don't get any um, benefit from putting in high efficiency heating equipment. Your mechanical equipment isn't factored into it, but with performance testing, your mechanical equipment's factored into the overall performance of your house. So you could put the best heating equipment in the world in your home here in town, but if you build by the prescriptive path, you don't get any credit for it. If you build by the performance path, you do. So one of the key things and takeaways with the stretch code is that with the performance path, you get these trade-offs where you can put in better mechanical equipment and maybe a little less insulation or a different type of window. And where under the prescriptive code, you have to put in exactly what the code tells you. And you don't get a benefit for putting in better heating equipment. Um, Seth already put the slide up. Um, 
this is it's our contact information, but I think I think there's going to be a lot of questions to be had. I do apologize in advance. Um, I know that kind of was a little rough. This is a new slide deck, so we're still trying to work up the kinks. So it's tough too because we're trying to also tailor a very technical and very code heavy discussion to uh, to folks. So we want to make sure that it's it covers enough. Yeah. <laughs> so so. Uh, with that, please feel free to ask any questions whatsoever, and we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, the rebate uh, incentive from the utility, mm -hmm. is that based on the current mass app? Yep. Not the upcoming? Yeah. So, we, we don't so yeah, let me just repeat the question so um, people can hear it. So your question was, were the rebate and incentives that were in the cost analysis, are they the current ones? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so the answer is yes. Thank you. Typically, for the builder, not necessarily homeowner. The homeowner can apply for them. Builder can apply. So the question was the rebates and incentives from the utility company just uh, applicable to the builder. It's whoever applies. But the big the big concern was that builders felt like they couldn't apply for them. Okay. Uh, my son bought one house like that in Lakeville, 2013. I called him. I have a lot of other questions to ask, obviously, but. He was under the impression that all the rebates went already to the builder. It's not necessarily available to him. Now, if he could get some rebates, I don't know how, but where we write or who we call. So, typically, with a situation like that, one question I had too, because Lakeville's a municipal um, light and power company. So, right. Lake, Lakeville, Lakeville doesn't have a, like an ever source. They are. It's a municipal. Depends on depends on where he lives in Lakeville. Yeah. So let me let me just take a quick stab yeah. at this. So, um, the prospective homeowner or the contractor can apply for the rebates and incentives. The contractor can decide whether or not he wants to pass along the savings to his customer or not. If he's the one that applies. Yeah. So that's that's basically how that works. So um, if you're asking how you would facilitate that, you would go to the MassSave website, or you would call MassSave, um, and you would ask about, you know, you uh, building a house, you know, and ask about what the rebates and incentives that would be available f through their program for for your construction. Well, is there not in the building inspector or whatever in that town? Don't they have? under some file that that house was built and does it conform? I don't, I don't even know if it has any um, talking with the builder. I, you know, so let me make sure I understand. What, so what's your question exactly? No, you talk about hers. You talk about uh, compliance. So, so, let's, so let's back up. So your son lives in Lakeville? Yeah. And he built a new house? He didn't build it. He bought it. He, he bought, bought it. it. In 2013, okay. It was, uh, so he wouldn't. He would not have to go if he purchased the house and it was already built. Um, did he? He bought it through the builder. He bought it. Yeah, okay. All right. So, Jim, can you help me out? When did? When yeah, did? Speculation, at least in our community, is we don't have a lot of speculation built um, homes built. So, which is probably a little bit odd from other communities. But if there's a, a developer or a builder who's building a home on speculation for sale, he would retain those rebates. He's the one who he's the one who worked with the hers rater. He's the one who okay. used the performance pack. Um, and, and a lot of times there are trade-offs in how he develops the home as far as what he can actually get for rebates for different appliances or different um, utilities. Um, and so normally he would get that rebate. He turns around, he sells it. He also has, um, one of the things that we have found is a, a huge benefit in a community where they are doing speculative building using the HERS rating because it, it is so much like the Energy Star buildings that used to be built years ago and are still built today, but they have a stronger market value. Um, so the builders like it for that reason, mm -hmm. but at least in my own community, if you have a homeowner who has hired a contractor to build his home for him, that homeowner gets that incentive. Yeah, that, that, that and so just a little background uh, further on Jim, he's the building inspector in Acushnet, but he's a Lakeville resident. Do you live in Lakeville? Yes. yes. Oh. 
Uh, I have some questions because I don't know when to ask those questions because they, if you're the So it would depend though. So so um, we can talk about this offline because you, you're, your question is really more specific to well, your son's home than... I'm using him. I, I, I understand that. coming to my town, so I wanted to find out so, I think I can. so uh, yeah, but I mean, I under. I go to town meeting and I want to accept them or not accept them. You know, a lot of us. I know. I understand. I'm, I'm go we're going to do our best to answer your question. It's not that we're not going to do that. It's just that, um, uh, I I think the explanation that Jim gave is about the best we're going to be able to do. If you buy a house that's a spec house. Um, the person that, that did the construction uh, would have been the person that would have had the opportunity to apply for the rebates and incentives. He may choose to pass that savings along to the person that buys it. Well, I, I can't say one way or the other or not, but as Jim is also saying, it's if you build a custom home and you're working with a general contractor, um, you can usually include that in your contract with him to make sure that he's applying for and maximizing all the rebates and incentives that would be applicable to a stretch code house so that you do get the benefit of those savings in your contract cost. I, I think one I think one additional question you had though was about about finding out the unique um, well, so I was trying to get to that yeah. too, okay, and so it would depend on when that home was built in Lakeville and whether or not the stretch code was in effect in Lakeville at that time or not. If if it was, if it was, then the then the HERS rating would be on file with the building inspector's office in Lakeville, not with Jim because he's pushing it, <laughs> but but um, with the building inspector in in Lakeville. Yeah. So it, can I jump on piggyback on this example? Sure. Um, if the house were uh, whatever the speculator, uh, the, the, the uh, contractor is building on speculation, and he applies for the uh, rebates, and the costs say are on a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, twenty seven hundred or something you said roughly to do this which might be that much more than the basic building code mm -hmm. construction. Now, theoretically, he could apply for Gas rebates, yeah. and they would offset each other. Exactly, right? yep, so correct. So you could sell the house theoretically for the same amount as you build a house under the old code. Right. There you go. Yeah, this cost analysis shows that uh, basically yeah. it's well, yeah. wh whoever applies, right? Yeah. Wh yeah. Whoever applies for the rebates and incentives, um, they pretty much cancel out any extra upfront cost uh, initially. And then uh, the other thing that's important is to sh is to that's notice nice. that there's there's a savings uh, because of the energy um, efficiency that that you get after you live in the house. N not to mention, by the way, that the house lives the way it's supposed to. So it's not drafty in the winter, and it's cool if you have air conditioning in the summer. So. May I, I have a few questions. So could I sit up here because I want to sure. be able to you, write down? Sure, you can. Because I'm another decision maker, so I'm just trying to get the facts. Yep. So please bear with me. She's a decision but, maker. Yeah, she's, she's a voting person. Yeah, she's a voting person. Yeah, she's a voting person. Yeah, you vote on it. <laughs> no, well, it's just that I want to be able to write, and I want to get yeah. back. Sure. I'm still yeah. under the 2009 mentality, yeah. in full disclosure. So um, knowledge is power. So I want to understand. Well, definitely. But I do want to make a comment that I'm a I'm just a little bit disappointed because when we had the presentation the first time with the board of selectmen, I was very excited because we had all committed to having another forum to get more detailed information. But I thought we were, we had agreed that we we were going to bring a few builders in here, primarily a builder that n is not necessarily pro stretch code, so we could see, you know, from an expert who. So I, I just like to comment on that. I mean, that was that was not that was nothing that I agreed to. Um, oh, the the deal here is the town of Carver okay. and the interest in the town um, is what's okay. to be served here okay. tonight. So um, what I 
promised to bring was Mike okay. as the expert gotcha. and Jim as a code right. official so. that's doing it in another town. So gotcha. It's okay. I did talk to a few builders uh, okay. on my own. So and just on that, we haven't found anyone that's come to us that is actually opposed to this from a building standpoint. Doesn't mean they're not out there. It's just that we weren't able to find anybody. Okay. So we did try. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I, I do have a few questions. So. Um, one of the questions uh, was, and this is for someone else, is what is the annual payout to the green communities in Mass for 2016? And what would the projected grant amount be for Carver? <coughs> and is there any documentation backing this up? I guess the concern, and my concern as well, so, is um, a lot of these programs start off with incentives and grants, and then um, if I understood the presentation before correctly, that the more towns that adopt the stretch code, the you get a certain portion of the money with the state and you have to distribute it to all the um, towns that are part of the stretch code. So, so in, give in me a second, state, let me get my cheat sheet. Yeah. yeah, no, no problem. And the similar question in regards to So rebates. let's let's do the first one first. Okay. okay. Let's let's stick to one question at a time because I'm not too smart and I can't <laughs> No, it's not. Juggle more than one at a time. <laughs> it's okay. So your question, your first question was, oh, how, much, how much money have we granted so far? Yes, in Massachusetts for 2016. For 2016 or for the whole time the program's been? For 2016. Okay, so we just, um, we just had a new round of green communities, Yeah. Uh, 30 of them. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but I believe it was a little over $2 million. And we've just had 72 existing green communities apply for competitive grants. And so the amount of money that was requested in those applications was $14 million. Um, whether or not we'll be able to grant all of that $14 million or not, I'm not sure yet. But let's go back to the, the total numbers so far. So my program at present um, yes. by statute. Now I can see you. <laughs> yeah, um, is um, funded up to $20 million per year. Okay. And that's for everything, including, you know, my salary, the, um, you know, the overhead of the department. Sure. Of which, when I asked my our CFO about this um, recently, said that we're, we run at about a seven percent max uh, overhead, so we do a pretty good job of distributing the money to the services that we're supposed to be providing. So, what the numbers I can tell you, very you know, uh, with no problem, is that we've been doing this since 2010, since May of 2010, and we've granted 67 million dollars, a little more than that, 67.4 million, I believe. Okay, when... And the other thing you asked is, is how much would the designation grant for Carver be? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to give me a little bit, of, allow a little bit of a range because it's done, um, it's a minimum of 125,000. You guys have done as of right siting for solar generation here, so that would get you another 10,000. And then the rest is based on a, a formula, a, a standard Department of Revenue formula uh, that's based on per capita income compared to the rest of the state and your population. And I think the number I gave you when I came to see the selectmen was what, maybe between 160 and $170,000, Mike, something like that? Yeah. That we will be granted? If you're designated. Now, once you're designated, um, you, once you're a green community, you can be eligible for additional um, grants in the future. Uh, every year, if you work the system the way it can be done, um, up to a max of $250,000. So I'll just give you an example. So the town of Hanover has been a green community since, 20, uh, since 2010. Um, we've granted I believe just around eight hundred thousand dollars to hand over over time, and they've just applied for a new uh, competitive grant, um, which may put them over a million dollars uh, in grant money from us. 
are they comparable to population size as uh, population size as we are? Do you got you know what um, I need to find exactly what I'm looking for and I can maybe give you a better um, number no, on okay. that. I can. Um, so I know you said the formula. But, but but the thing that's important is that the initial grant is the one that's mostly driven by your per capita income and um, and population. Okay. Um, after that, uh, every year you can apply for up to 250. Okay. And the grants aren't guaranteed from year to year, is it? I mean, I mean the total program. You, we, we, so I mean, our our the the, the uh, our revenue yeah. comes from outside appropriation. We're not subject to um, the budget process. Okay. It comes from regional greenhouse gas initiative auction proceeds, and it also comes from alternative compliance payments from the renewable portfolio standard. Oh. Um, we can talk. We can talk about that too. But but the, what's what what's important for you as as a select person here in Carver is to know that um, we're not subject to um, appropriation. We've um, granted that sixty seven point four million dollars, I believe, and the money's real. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, try, I want to go try to go quick. Um, you give the stats of 189 municipalities in Massachusetts. What about across the United States? This is this is a state program. This is only a state program. This is only in Massachusetts. This is this is the first of its kind in the whole country, and we got a lot of other places that are trying to copy it. Yeah, there's a okay. there's a lot of states looking to adopt stretch codes, like Rhode Island's looking at it, New Hampshire's looking at it, but they haven't actually done anything with it yet. Okay, I don't want to get into a lengthy question because I don't want to hog the time. But you have just created a very big question for me because it was explained to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, please do, because I am not experienced in this field, that the stretch code became part of a component of the international code that was mandated by, I believe, FEMA back several years ago and that it is nationwide the international code so so you're partially correct and and kudos to you you got, a, uh, you got the well, terminology yeah, correct. Explain the ICC. Yeah, yeah. so the international energy conservation code is um, built by the International Code Council yeah um, Many states have adopted the International Energy Conservation Code. The one we currently have in Massachusetts right now is what they call IECC 2015. IECC. It, they update the code every three years. So we just moved out of 2012. Yeah. But states don't have to adopt the International Energy Code. Um, that's up to the state. We actually in Massachusetts happen to be obviously very cutting edge when it comes to energy efficiency. So like, I'm trying to think of another state nearby that has, Maryland has I, has the same code as us, where Florida where Florida has the International Energy Conservation Code, but I think they, they're using the 2009 version of the code. Okay. So to be, a, to, to take part in a program like the Green Communities Program, one part of that is you have to adopt the international energy codes. So Massachusetts has been doing this since 2000 and, geez, 2007, I think now, not a little bit longer, it's been over 10 years mm -hmm. that we've been adopting these international codes. So the code today you have in Carver is the International Energy Conservation Code. The stretch code is unique to Massachusetts and it's amendment to the Massachusetts building code. Okay. So stretch code is totally unique to Massachusetts. The stretch code that we presented on today is, is Massachusetts. As, as well as the Green Communities Program is, is unique to Massachusetts. But the International okay, Conservation Code is not. It's, it's, uh, it's, it was built and designed for communities, uh, states to adopt a code that's already written. They didn't have to write one themselves, and it's a, it's a really well-written code. So it made it very easy for like Massachusetts, Maryland, other states that have adopted the international codes. But prior to us adopting the international codes, we actually wrote our own energy efficiency code. Okay. So was the piece about FEMA required 
I don't. I, yeah, see, I don't know. I don't think that piece yeah. is correct. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't think the FEMA references. So, okay. No, but so FEMA, uh, FEMA does drive the codes. You, yeah. Okay. FEMA does drive the codes. The, the general building code really is driven by FEMA because FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Program. Yeah. Every time we have an enormous hurricane or something yeah. that wipes out cities, yeah. they decide, well, there may be a change that we need to make in the code, whether we're going to raise the height of buildings above the flood um, level or whether we're going to add wind um, because of some of the tornadoes that we've yeah. had, there's certain requirements. That's what generates the ICC to make code changes every three years. Um, sometimes they're not necessarily better, but the, the IEC, the energy code, just happens to be part of the base code. So a lot of people may assume, well, it's not really FEMA. FEMA doesn't have much to say about what's done on the energy side of it. They're more interested in structural, but they're all tied together. They're all part of the same code. <coughs> Thank you. And just to, just to go back to one other thing um, in terms of how this works in, in towns and, and, and the funding, um, I brought Jim along because he's a building official, but he's also uh, my primary contact in a Kushnet. Um, so he can yes. explain to you, if you want, about how this process has worked, where they yeah. got their initial designation grant, and how the funding worked, and how the, how the work was done, right. and then how they applied for um, a competitive grant and received it. Mm -hmm. um, and have recently finished up all that work and now they've just applied for a second competitive grant so I mean we're hoping that sometime this summer we're talking about a cushion that may be uh, being granted over six hundred thousand dollars worth of energy efficiency money to do things that they wouldn't be able to do um, in their schools in their town hall in their fire station um, without the money that they've been getting from us. And it's been firm, right, Jim? It's Good been real money. Which was my other big question, is how does um, voting for the stretch code or not voting for the stretch code impact our town buildings? So if we approve this stretch code, how is it going to benefit us I know you said 100,000 square foot. How, how big is the new school going to be? How many square feet? I forget. It's new school permitted. Mm -hmm. Is the school the new school's permitted? You guys are building it, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah so wouldn't, it wouldn't be subject anyway. But I will say this. It, that's probably a stretch code building already if you're using MSBA funds. OK, so what, what is the pros and cons for the town buildings? How are they impacted? Well, you, you're going to have a more efficient, better living building if it's done to the stretch code. And you'll be paying less taxes from from the owners or from the residents. Residents will be paying less money to maintain that building. Why? I mean, I know that with the stretch code, it's going to have the requirements to put certain things in there, like insulation, etc. But what would be to stop our whoever whoever the architect and the engineer and all that is is to do it on their own without having the stretch code? to just mirror the stretch code but not having the stretch code, if that makes any sort of sense. If I can. I think it does. Um, as, as I, I, think, I think probably in a Kushnet we have a really good example. We have a number of buildings that were built 100 years ago, 60 years ago, a lot of old schools that have been rehabbed. Um, we've taken our Green Communities funds and applied them to every single building that we have in town. We also recently built a brand new police station, 11,000 square foot building, which doesn't come under the stretch code. It was architect designed, contractor built, no funds available from the state to build police stations. Um, now for whatever reason, our brand new police station is the only building that we have in our community that doesn't have LED lighting in it. It costs us more to light that building than it does to, build, uh, to light a 100 year old school that we put $154,000 in of green community's money um, as the energy renovations for that building. Okay. And I think these are important for the, the people within a community to understand. We have already reduced our energy consumption by 20%, mm -hmm. um, which is money that stays in the general fund and can be used for schools or for, for other aspects of, of running um, town government. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, you asked me to ask it as separate questions. Um, the mass save incentive and rebates is, uh, how, how long can we be protected to know that those are gonna happen every single year? So the utility companies here in Massachusetts and energy efficiency service providers yeah. are required by the Department of Public Utilities to file three year utility filing. So the one that was that we're currently under right now goes through the end of 2018. Uh, yeah, it's, we're in our second, essentially second year. Um, so they file them for three years. So we have them till 2019. I can tell you, um, my day job, um, I actually run the Mass Save new construction program. Yeah. Um, Will here also works with me in it. Yeah. I've been doing it for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and we've not a a actually seen a decrease in funding. We've seen it actually increase over time because utility companies see energy efficiency as a power generation option. Um, as power plants are taken offline, the best way to m have more energy is to conserve. And so they are actually putting more money routinely into these type of programs. But yep. for right now, till the end of the, the current plan we're under is good till the 2019. Yeah. And in 2019, a new utility filing plan new will New utility filing. Yep. Okay, and then I'm almost done. Yep, and that's required by statute. Yep. It, when, I hope I can read my chicken scratch. Because <laughs> I was, that's why it was hard to write over there. Um, when you say that it's for new construction only, <laughs> wouldn't a new home pretty much automatically be energy efficient like I chose just out of my own accountability to buy an energy efficient refrigerator yep. yeah so if you're building a new home wouldn't someone just on their own and I gotta tell you my my concern is like with these rebates that that was a big part of your analysis mm -hmm. but I, I would bet dimes to donuts that nine times out of ten it's the builder that's getting that incentive incentive and then maybe ten out of maybe 9.9 .9 out of 10, they don't pass that savings on to the homeowner. I could be wrong. Yeah. Could yeah, be wrong. And, and I think to that, real quick, and I'll, 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 take, I'll take these. Can't uh, speculate yeah. on that yeah. idea. I mean, it's hard to tell. Hmm? I don't think you're wrong. Oh, yeah. No, but as I say, I, you know, I, as far as that goes, the long, like Seth, if you break it down at two buckets on those analysis, yeah. Whether the builder or the homeowner gets the initial upfront money, yeah. the homeowner is getting a better home that's gonna, cost less to operate oh, over time. And so that's where the savings are gonna go. And I think to your point, which I think was really good, which is, and I think some of the gentleman over there also said the same thing is, it is gonna cut down on the builders out front money that they have to put forward to meet the stretch code is mm -hmm. having those utility incentives. Yep. But if you get a chance to look at those cost analysis again, look at them well. without the incentive. You're still cost cash positive in year one on both examples. It's good to have the incentives, but to be honest with you, you're getting a better performing home in the long run, so you're actually saving more money. But that, that was the only yeah. piece of the question you didn't answer. Like if I was a new homeowner right now and I didn't want to deal with the stretch code and say I had a choice, and I was talking to a builder, would he not go over, well, if you use this insulation, you are going to save more money over the life of the loan. So, uh, yes, I want that. You're going to save so, this if you do so this. Probably not. Yeah, so, so to, be honest with you, to be honest with you, and I'm not knocking, I'm a licensed builder. My friend always has a licensed builder. Given the options, most of the time, we're going to do the bare minimum. If the code requires us to put in an R49 in the attic, guess what we're going to probably put in? R49. And we're going to put in whatever we can put in for the windows is what, whatever the code geez, whatever, the, whatever the code says, we're going to probably do. Unless we have a savvy homeowner who this is really important for them and they're going to drive the decision making. Typically, there are some builders out there that are building some amazing high performance homes, but they're the exception, not the norm. The typical builder and again, it's not nothing wrong with it. The code is state law. So if building to minimum code standard is state law and you're meeting the code, then okay. you're compliant. The big thing is, and that thing with stretch code is, that was one of the kind of misconceptions, things that people would bring up when we were bringing this was, well, if we don't adopt it, I mean, we're, our builders will just do it anyhow. Yeah. There's no guarantee your builders are gonna do it. And with prescriptive codes, with this prescriptive path and following the prescriptive code, there's no guarantee it's gonna really work. Seth here can actually tell you he had a home built for, for in, himself. In 1999, you know, and um, had a great builder. Jim knows who it was. Um, 
great reputation here in town. And I wasn't doing this job. I wish I had known then what I know now. And I would have insisted on some things that mm -hmm. I didn't, I, you know, um, air sealing in my house, uh, insulation mm -hmm. levels, Stops. things like that, mm -hmm. um, where the ducts end up being running. You know, like my second floor air conditioning system never worked right mm -hmm. until I had a buddy of mine come and fix it because yeah. I was trying to air condition the attic air in my house. <laughs> um, and so, it, um, you know, it's all part about of being an informed consumer, but also, um, you know, things things are changing in the codes to help prevent those types of things too. Okay, thank Can I make you. An sure. Do I hold on to? <laughs> I mean, there, there are two two elements that are the two largest expenditures that every American makes are his automobile and his home. Right. Today, or I, I should, if we go back to when Henry Ford was making, Henry Ford was making cars according to the prescriptive method. He just was taking elements, throwing it together, and making an automobile. Um, I don't think it was until probably the 1970s that Americans started crash testing their cars. Because you have engineers who design the type of bolts, the type of metal, um, the airbags, the kind of tires, the suspension system, um, everything that goes into an automobile. But then they, they really started testing them, and now we have safe automobiles. We have automobiles that are, are controlled by the government, so on and so forth. A larger expenditure is our home. Mm -hmm. And the home is basically the same thing. It's, it's put together of components that are made by many different manufacturers. They come together, your contractor yeah. assembles it, but there's no testing. Yeah. I think the best thing that we can actually do is have a performance test put on that home to, so that we know when we buy it yeah. that we now have the best product that we can possibly have. That's a good analogy, thank you. I'm gonna steal that. Um, the one question that I didn't, I didn't get the, feel like it was answered or I, I didn't get the answer, so I apologize, was if the HERS rating doesn't pass, what happens? So You did yeah. give some explanation <laughs> so, so, on. So Jim's so, the code yeah. official. So I, I will say I'll defer to him, but I do have some things that I can touch I mean, on. we have had that situation. But it's usually by builders who are, well, the, the, I've only had it actually twice by the same builder, yeah. and it's because he's not paying attention. Uh, and the result okay. is it doesn't pass. There's some destructive remedy to what he has to do. Oh, okay. Um, but if they if they work with the HERS rater yeah. and they follow his instructions and work <clears throat> with the code official, that doesn't happen. And, and that's and what you were saying about they go back one and two and three times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and it's, and it's, we, we use the thing, it's just like any other subcontractor. No. There's a plumbing code, there's an electrical code. The plumbing, the, pl the plumbing installer has to meet the plumbing code. If not, the builder's not gonna pay them. They're gonna remedy that. They're gonna figure out how to get it to pass. No. The electric's the same, same thing with the stretch code and the HERS rating is there's a remedy there if it doesn't meet it. But on top of that too, you're paying this HERS rater as a subcontractor to make sure you meet the code. Okay. So I've had people say, well, what happens if I don't meet the code? I'm like, don't pay the hearse writer until okay. till he fixes it and gets you to meet the code. Okay, I guess. So, the contract. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. No, no, thank yeah, you. Great questions. The, the other thing that I would just say, you know, um, because I, you know, I know you're an elected official here in town and appreciate the fact that you're here for <laughs> one thing yeah. and you're here asking questions, yeah, which is another, no, it's really, yeah. this, this is, this is what this is for. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of how my program works though, overall, I would recommend, and I'll be happy to help you make these contacts, reach out to the other towns in the area yeah. that are doing it, mm -hmm. um, people in your position. Yeah. And you know, ask them how it's working for them. Um, I, I, you know, I think that for the most part, you'll get a, a favorable uh, response. Um, and we're always looking. And yeah. I think Jim will vouch for me f to wait. You know, ways to implement our program better. But um, yeah. in terms of your concern about the money, where does it come from, and if it's real? Um, so far, yeah. in seven and a half years, it's it's been real, and yeah. I plan on it. You know being like that for a little bit longer because I can't retire for a while. I will seek out those numbers, um, all, you know, because I still have some, uh, and again, I'm going to absorb all this information, but, you know, I read um, that in October 2016, Middleborough did not pass it, and they have quotes from builders that were not the, in There was a lot of misinformation uh, at that Middleborough town meeting. Um, oh. 
Uh, well, I'm, I'm just... Quoted in the paper, so... It, well, well, you don't believe everything you read in the paper, do you? <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. There's no fake news. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so Middleborough's going to bring it up again uh, at at the Springtown meeting. We'll see how that goes. I mean, uh, I have no idea how it's going to go. Right. Um, but um, um, my, underst appreciate my, my understanding fun. was, uh, and I'm a resident of Middleborough, but I was I was busy doing something like this that night <gasps> and wasn't able to go to my town meeting. There was a lot of misinformation at that meeting. Um, and so one of the things we're doing right now in Middleborough is we're trying to do more of this. Okay. So people right. can understand what's going on and uh, and what it is and what it's not. I appreciate your time because I know this is your second time, Seth, coming here. So I appreciate your time and. Well, thank it's actually you more than that. <laughs> but I'm glad to come. Well, I mean, the, in the mo more recent future, it's the second. Uh, I'm time. glad to do it. Yeah, I am. Sorry. Hey, you asked a lot of questions. Who was going to write these grants? Uh, the inspector was talking about on an ongoing basis initially and then ongoing basis so the town applies for it and so the town will be responsible it's pardon me we don't have a grant writer we so write it depends on you know this is something mike and and the select board will will work on in terms of how they want to manage that but that's a local think, that's a lo bring all this to the town meeting i think all this needs to get settled because uh i i'm going to go to town meeting so, i'm probably going to ask the same question so that's a local issue well, that's either can make it or break it. So most grants come out of um, our office. Um, we do write the grants ourselves. We do have funding if we need special assistance in writing the grants. Uh, my understanding with these grants, they're pretty straightforward. They're not, they're not a dissertation that's going to take you three weeks to do. Um, and, and I'd like to hear from a cushion it, but my guess is you probably, well, how long do you spend on writing your average grant? <laughs> um, Mike, I, I actually wrote the grant for Kushnet. Um, I, I tried the first year, had a little bit of pushback from our selectmen, um, tried again the second year with the help of one of our selectmen, um, but basically I, I wrote the grant. Um, we actually get a lot of help from the consultants um, who, and, and we're at, we don't even pick the consultants, the consultants are actually, um, we're told by the Department of Energy Resources. Whoops. Who to use? Am I correct? No, on the uh, efficiency stuff. Yes, on the energy, no, stuff no, that, that we get from Rise. Yeah, so no, that's that's the town's choice yeah. on yeah. which consultants, which energy efficiency people you would use through uh, through EverSource. That's the town's decision. But that was funded through EverSource. <laughs> yeah, they, we didn't pay anything for that, right. and and having those engineers work with us, and they've been fantastic. Seth, um, would you explain that process there just for the Rise? Sure. So. Um, so again, part of uh, what we were talking about with the uh, energy efficiency plans and, and the whole Mass Safe um, program. Okay, so most of you are probably familiar with Mass Safe as uh, regular residential consumers, right? Well, there's also a whole municipal energy efficiency part of Mass Safe, and so um, your representative from EverSource is somebody that I work with on a regular basis. Um, he's a person that uh, I've worked uh, with Jim with in a Kushnet. Um, and so Eversource um, has a stable of energy efficiency uh, vendors, they call them, um, that are available to cities and towns to do uh, energy studies on your buildings, your processes, um, uh, at no cost to the town. And those studies are the types of things that we roll into uh, a part of the grant application. Um, for identifying which buildings are going to have which energy conservation measures done to them, how much prospectively they could cost, how much energy you'd be saving, uh, things like that. So that that's part of it. Um, so that's what Jim is referring to. Um, I'm available as a resource to help guide um, through the process. I can't actually do it because my department ends up reviewing the applications, but I'm available as a resource. Um, it's also possible um, that if you're going to um, try to apply this year that we can um, look into the opportunity you might have to get what we call a Municipal Energy Technical Assistance Grant that's available through DOER um, that um, could help you prepare your application. Um, you could apply for a block of money either as the town uh, or through your regional planning uh, authority through SERPED 
um, to get them to, to give you a hand with getting the application together also. So we do have, again, have money for technical assistance if there's not any types of grants available. It's the technical assistance for writing the engineering scope or doing the um, the the electric load of this building. And I and everybody knows I love these six, nine lights that take half an hour for them to turn on. <laughs> you know, they'd be able to come in and identify what it is we need and we'd be able to do that. As far as the narrative component, as far as the, the quantitative budget stuff, we would take care of putting that together but from that base information. We'd be glad to get, uh, be glad to get some um, examples of you know what those look like Seth, I mean on these competitive grants how long how many pages are they approximately so uh, on the uh, on the designation grant application no the technical ones the designation so, is straightforward so, well so designation is what you're looking to do now right um, so they're very similar in terms of the, the scope so it would depend but I mean uh, a town like Carver with your you know uh, I don't know it, it could be like 20 to 25 pages max so I have, I have a question. Well, I have You're asking us to go to town meeting and accept or deny this, the, the, the stretch goal. But we don't really know if a builder wants to come into our town and take on that responsibility unless you can encourage that person that you already have X number of grant money available. But you haven't done any of that, and so you don't know. So. I don't understand how all this is going to work. Well, I don't think we're proposing to give any grant money to any builder coming into town. I don't think that was ever part of it. The, the grant money we would get would be to come in and retrofit this building and put in more energy efficient lighting in this building <coughs> or to upgrade some of the gas guzzling um, DPW vehicles we have to make them more energy efficient. That's where the grant money would go and things like that. The, deve the, the builder, um, they would be able to go through other programs and look to get any type of incentives through Mass Save or whatever it may be, but nothing from the towns. Okay, so, okay is right. that how that works? Yeah, so the, the grant money that the town could get through my department would pay for things like energy efficiency stuff in town hall, uh, fire state school. Your your high school is like a, it's a mess. Is yeah. is well, I'm not saying it's a mess. <laughs> it's a, but it's it's a very target rich environment well, for energy. Properly maintained. Well, I, I, I'm not even going there. I'm just saying <laughs> it, it based on its age. Okay, it is. It's a real, you have a lot of opportunity in that school on energy efficiency. So, I guess, stretch code, coming into our town, we have to apply, or we have to vote on it. So we're really talking about new, new residential homes. New homes. Okay. So, you have to, how does a builder want to go through all of what he or she has to go through? for these rebates and stuff like that. My son told me his builder, or the person he bought the house from, that man spent $10,000 to make that house um, a green house. So I can't, I can't speak to that because I, I don't well, know no. whether that's a real I'm number or not. I'm in town here. How, who's going to come in and buy, build a new home? Well, if you, if a hundred and a hundred and... To apply for the stretch okay, so, so let, let me finish. Once but see the graphic? Once you have a stretch code in your town, that means every new home has to go along with that stretch code. They can't go back to local. That's correct. So there's more, uh, more you know, a builder has to be willing to, to, do, to do that. They put it into the cost. So Jim's got his hand up. And again, he's, he's a building official who works with the builders every day. Okay. It has been our experience that it's, it's almost easier for the builders to comply with the performance path than it is for them to use the base code and just do the prescriptive path. It's, it's, it's a lot less complicated. They have a gentleman who works, and at least the HERS Raiders that work in our community um, work with <coughs> the builders to get the incentive payments that come from the utilities back on a regular basis. So we had pushback initially. In fact, my wiring inspector also is, is a, a, a speculative builder. Um, and his first home, well, I can't repeat what he said to me when he first did it. But after that one home, it's like, it's like this is the best thing since sliced bread. And that's, you know, he, time after time, he says, oh, this is the best thing the town ever did. Yep. Typically, when a builder does the performance path, they tend not to go back. Okay, the other part of that, which is, okay, here's the front part, the building and passing it. Somebody at town meeting has to encourage people 
if new people are going to come into our town and, and buy these new houses that are with the stretch code, uh, built by the stretch code, you really need to tell them how wonderful it is. I mean, my son raves, and there's no doubt about it, uh, how much money and how energy efficient it is and how much money they're saving. Um, he has gas and propane because they don't have that gas. On yeah, there's no natural gas in Lakeville. Yeah, yeah. So he has to have propane, unfortunately. And here's the bad part. There's a 500-gallon tank sunk in the ground, and the contractor, uh, put whoever he hired to put that in, has, provides the propane. So my son cannot, he can't negotiate with anybody. He has to, he has to be with that guy. He owns the tank. So some of these down things aren't so good, and I don't know what our town or the building would do, building inspector would do when they do this. Is that not normal to drop a tank like that, and that's the end result? I know you talked I, about heat yeah, pumps. Yeah, I can't. I can't speak to that. Yeah, I can't speak to that. But you also mentioned heat pumps, yep. which is probably another way to go. My son bought the house in 2013. I don't know what you had. What yeah, the technology's gotten so much better and it's so much more being used yeah. than yeah. it probably was in It's also because it's Lakeville, um, in, uh, I don't know where it is in Lakeville, but if, if he's right served. from the country club. So he's serviced by Middleborough Gas and Electric. Yeah, and so. Um, yeah, I think that. So yeah. one, one quick thing I will say though about the encouragement of people moving to your community. So I've been doing these since 2010. Uh, these stretch code informational sessions and I've been to some towns that have wanted to vote this in and, and maybe it didn't get voted in the first time, second time, third time. But what ended up happening is that as you see in this map right now, so this is the stretch code, but when you look at the green community map, like I live on the Cape, I was born and raised on the Cape. I did the stretch code presentation in Provincetown and what ended up happening with Wellfleet and Truro is a lot of people were saying, well why aren't we a green community? I don't want to live in a community that's not a green community. Why aren't we doing that? And I think what ends up happening when I've done other towns that are surrounded by green communities and stretch code communities, that the builders are working in those towns, they're used to that type of construction practice, and now all of a sudden towns are forgoing the opportunity to get this grant money because they're not doing the stretch code. And now that the stretch code isn't that much of a stretch, it's, it's so much easier for builders to understand the stretch code it's to me the big barrier to not adopting it would just be the fact that exactly what you said, it's education. It's, it's educating the consumer, the homeowner, the resident, and the, right. the builders. So the other down for him is if he wants to put an addition and he says you have to go back and make sure everything that you want to do is compatible or compliant. But you can't put a fire, just, just an example. He said, you can't put a fireplace up with a chimney because it's too drafty. You have to go with propane, gas, so you don't have that ambiance that you might want with it. So there are some well, after, so after you wouldn't that. You wouldn't in the base code. That's so, Building code absolutely prohibits anybody from putting the fireplace in unless it has a glass enclosure. That's not, the stretch code has nothing to do with that. With the stretch code, he told me that the stretch code would prohibit that. No, it's base code. The base code. The, the base code does too. So right now in Carver, you're going to do that. You're saying it would require a booking instead of an open chimney? Yeah, because he said, so it, it would, according to the, he did say hers, I don't think he knew what about what it was, but it would just open up too much draft. Or well, I'm not, the, I'm, not the, I'm not the code official or the expert, <laughs> but know, know that the situation that he's saying he can't do, it, it, it has nothing to do with the stretch code. It would be the same yeah. thing with the base code for an addition. If so, if he wants to add on to his home and he wants to do a, a, what we would all here probably consider a traditional masonry fireplace, um, you can't do it if it's open faced by the base code or the stretch code. Yeah. Isn't that correct, Jim? Correct. Right. Yeah. Excuse me. If, I just want to make sure I understand because I thought you said that he, was, he can't have an open chimney, that it has to be like a propane type of setting and not just the open, like. Throw the wood in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it, it, it's not the open. It, face. You you can have a fire. You can have a fireplace. Yeah, you can have a wood burning. That has a wood burning fireplace, but it has to meet the requirements of the code, which means it can't be open faced. It has to have. It has to have a glass enclosure. Glass enclosure. Right. So the glass enclosure is the one that's protecting. Uh, it has to be closed at all times, otherwise. Correct. 
It's, it's in the base code, too. That was just a small yeah. example that he gave me that. Well, I, I have one of those fireplaces that, you know, that, that you think is great. You know what it does? It sucks all the heat out of my house. That reconstruction, you have to comply within, there must be certain things that you have to comply with for something after you build your home and you want to add to it. Um, no, once your home is built, the only code you'd have to adhere to would be what would be the base code. So the code you have today in town. For the addition. Yeah. So if you're renovating a home or, or doing modifications. Doing so I thought you said no, none of that. Stuff. That was I'm like an every the, once the stretch code is applied, you build the house according to the stretch code and you want to put on an addition or, or change. The stretch code does not apply. Does not apply. Does not apply. Wow, that's not what my son said. So maybe he's. All right, so so the difference is no. So okay, so let's let's follow this through. Okay, the difference is when his house was built. Twenty thirteen. Right, there was a stretch code for additions and renovations, and now there isn't, as of January first of this year. So stretch code builds the greenhouse, the house, whatever you want to call it, house green. <laughs> then it goes back to any new additions and changes to local. Well, so so what we should, what but what you want to do here in Carver is you want to you want to be living in the present in what the stretch code is and what it's not, not what's going on with your son's house in Lakeville that was built in 2013. Well, no, just stay stick he's with. A resident like I would be. But stay stay with coming. stay with me, just stay with me for a second. The codes changed since your son's house was built, and so now the difference between the two is really insignificant. All right, and so the scenario you're talking about today is if I built a brand new house uh, in Carver that was a stretch code house, right? And then three or four years down the road after that, I wanted to build an addition on it. That addition would not be subject to the stretch code. It would be subject to the base code because it's an addition. So the whole point here is education, and that's what's lacking. Well, we're trying to we're trying to trying we're trying to, to fix that now. Well, a lot of people are going to go to that town meeting, and the education is really lacking. So, but that's why we're I here. I mean, this this is the this is the best, uh, you know, uh, Mike. Right? I mean, this is the best I can do as the person who um, is trying to implement the program. We're here. So, and, and, and we're on we're on cable, and we've talked to elected and appointed officials here in town. So. The, the other thing too that's changed. I have direct TV. Yeah. I'm sorry, we don't have cable. That's another issue we have. Well, so it's, so we're then we're glad you're here. <laughs> so uh, I think I've lived here too long. So I know you have a you have a que you have a question. Um, I just want to touch upon one thing. When again talking about education, so when the stretch code first came out, builders weren't were are required to renew our we we're required to renew our licenses as we are today. The difference is now the state requires builders to go through continuing education courses 12 hours a year of continuing education so part of that's on energy efficiency and part of that's on the stretch code so you have a more informed and a better informed builder than you did a couple of years ago and every code official has to go through training as well so again this isn't something that's new or experimental to builders it's something they're very very aware of it's educating the consumer the end user of the home you're just bought an energy efficient home you bought a home in a stretch community this is why it's important to you because it's going to be more okay, education. Okay, so is there, as a building inspector, when the town, our town accepted that, are people on a register so that when changes come, they're going to be notified? There's, there won't be anything that retroactively affects your home that's already been built. Uh, no, I, let, me, let me jump into here. I think what you're asking is, as a building inspector, as a building contractor, they're required to know what the updates are. So every three years when the building code changes, it's their job to know what the new rules and regulations are. So just back to your early point about your son, your son was correct in his statement two years ago that an addition would have to follow the stretch code. But as of January 1st this year, that addition component has been taken away for all properties in the state. So he no longer, he now can do an addition and not have to go through the stretch code. He now can build a fireplace as long as he has a glass enclosure or a stove, I'm sure, um, that would qualify. So it was more strict before. 
it's been refined to be less strict on the additions. Actually, it's not strict at all on the additions. It doesn't say anything about the additions. So, as, yeah. as my question was, is there some sort of a register that the person would fall into, and they could be notified with different strict changes? Uh, so, on that, your I your son. I my freezer because Mass say put in uh, a little brochure, and my husband says, "Oh, did you want to get rid of that freezer downstairs?" And they go, "Yeah." He said, "Well, call them up." They'll recycle for nothing and give you 50 bucks. <laughs> now, I would have never done that because I would have had to pay somebody to come and take it out. Well. So my point to you is, you know, as a resident paying taxes in this so-called greenhouse, the guy in the green coat, the the green coat are you shit. going to uh, let, so. the town, let them know or do they have to call I'll you? Sure because the green coat. if my it's son goes green. away with this idea that he's telling me to risk it today yeah. and that's not so, well, he needs to be educated. How are you going to educate your residents as well? Mm. I mean, that's the kind of education I'm saying. You want to sell me this in my town? Well, you better you better educate me a lot better than just somebody standing up saying, well, you want the scratch home? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, I think as far as the education part, it seems like the you know, contractor or the, or the building perspective, we have any information, any changes you want to do in your house. You want to put in a, a fireplace, you're going to have to get a permit, and they will tell you how to do it, you know, efficiently and what the code says. The stretch code um, <clears throat> for commercial, you said it's 100,000 square feet or above. Yep. Or above. Yep. Now, for uh, residential, uh, for new homes going in, is there a square footage there that someone wouldn't uh, underneath uh, certain square feet? No, nope, so it affects, it's all new, newly constructed all homes, new. regardless of the size. Uh, they used to be there used to be a size component, but, but it not anymore. Doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So, so they, any size yeah. home. Again, yeah, so if I if I if I wanted if I was contracting with you to build a two thousand square foot home, or a four thousand square foot home, or a thousand square foot home, or, or <laughs> whatever, you know, um, you know, uh, you as my contractor would have to get me a hers rating of fifty five or lower to get an occupancy permit. The difference between the, the uh, stretch the uh, performance and the prescriptive is. So I think it's very small. Is it just the HERS rating? It, it's, the, it's the modeling portion of the HERS rating. Again, co the, the base code requires you today in, in your town, if you were to build a new home, you would have to have infiltration testing done. You'd have to have a blower door put on a house, and you'd have to meet the requirement of the code, and you'd have to do the same thing for your ducts if they're outside condition space. And those testing that test is being performed by a HERS rater. Yeah. The difference is they don't have to put into an energy model unless they're doing the performance path. Just new, new, just new construction right. only. Yeah, um, and you also you also get the benefit of the Hertz rater working with your insulating contractor, your um, mechanical contractors as things go along, and you know helping the inspectional services people know that things are being installed correctly. The the savings that uh, you're saying the builder would get. Um, So, so that's a great question. I know there's certain towns that are really progressive, like the town of Harvard, Mass. They um, actually give a portion of the um, permit cost back to a builder if they go through an energy efficiency program and they show that they met the criteria. Um, again, that affects the builder. Yeah. Um, typically, with um, custom-built homes, to be honest with you, I, so again, I manage the program. I've been doing it for 10 years. On spec built homes, it's 100% being driven by the builder. Builder's committed to building that type of home and they've worked out every scenario and they're capitalizing on the incentives. On custom built homes, typically the person who's driving the builder to the program and to tap into incentive dollars is the customer, is the homeowner. So the homeowner, actually a lot of the builders that we have come to our program who've never participated before, literally, you know, 
So I got this homeowner, they want me to build them a home in this town <laughs> and they really, really want it to be very green and energy efficient. So I guess I gotta talk to you guys. So I, mean, I just talked to a builder today from Roxbury, never gone through our program, working with a HERS Raider because it's in Boston and you have to do a HERS Raider because it's a stretch code community. He didn't even know the program existed and he found out about it and was very excited to hear about it. The customer uh, was a uh, the, the builder, yeah, the builder was, but the, typically the customer drives the builder to the program um, if, on a custom built home. But, the, but making sure that the customer gets that information yep. to know that that savings could be obtained by him yep. if he wanted to go through the paperwork. Right, so what we do is we typically provide towns that, that want it. We provide for the building office a flyer so that they can have it, but on top of that too, when a pro project goes through our program, we typically try to make sure that we know who, th we need to know who the meter number belongs to, all that stuff. So we kind of engage with the customer. I think one of the things that builders do with the incentive programs that are very smart, they're very transparent about them, especially on a custom built home, because what they're saying to the homeowner is, listen, you can hire any of my competitors, but they're probably not gonna give you this money back. I'm gonna give you $4,000 back upon completion of the home. And I'll tell you, that makes a huge difference. We see that with heating equipment. There's a gas networks program, and the builders that, uh, the installers that tap into the gas networks program tend to close more sales because they're giving the money back to the homeowner than those ones that pocket the money. Um, because it really is a difference maker, and you can leverage those. Is there any kind of figures on um, payback for you know, usually people install a solar system to spend $15,000 and want to know how, how long it's going to take to pay them back. When you're you cranking in yeah. all these energy saving things, that's as a sale point to, yeah. to the customer. So the HERS rater can provide the builder that, and it can actually give you a lot of information that can be used as a, in a sales kit. Um, we're seeing more and more green uh, realtors who actually know energy efficiency and know how to sell green aspects of homes. Um, there is that information that tells you how much the homes are to perform. That cost analysis that you saw was basically generated that way. It was generated through REM reports, the REM rate reports that a HERS radar generates. So that information is all there and it's really good. And that's the neat thing about energy modeling because you can create several scenarios where you could sit down with a homeowner and go, if you go with scenario one, it's going to cost this amount of money, scenario two, scenario three. and each scenario is going to save you X number of dollars and the payback on it is going to be a year, two years, three years. But again, it's nice because you have those trade-offs where with the base code, if you just do a prescriptive build, there's no way to tell how the house is going to perform because you're not modeling it. Just quickly, because I'm curious, I'm like, it's almost passing a <laughs> time, so I'm, I'm hoping. Um, you said something though that got me back to being confused. You had mentioned that it's the consumer or the homeowner that drives the builder to the stretch code. Is no, no, no not, not the stretch code, the incentives. So, the so, and, and I'm just using that, and again, okay. this is based on- This is custom built yeah, homes. custom built homes. So it's part of your contract yeah. with the with the builder, yeah, right. You, you itemize. Yeah, I, I don't know if you've ever built a house. I mean, uh, I have. And no, I mean you itemize line item uh, stuff. So one of the things you would go over them with is say, you know, this is a stretch code home, so I want all my incentives and rebates. You talk to a custom home builder, and they'll tell you the worst thing that's ever happened to a custom home builder is Google, okay. because a homeowner people are better informed. Yeah, people will Google search everything, and they'll be like, energy efficient homes. And is, if you Google search energy efficient homes in Massachusetts, yeah. the Mass Save program oh, comes yeah. up. Yeah. So you know they're just gonna sit down with a bill and say, "I want to tap into this. Yeah. I want, yeah. I want this money." And so I know Carver. You know, uh, I I live in Middleborough. I mean, I know Carver has a, probably a pretty good balance of custom built homes and some specs. But I mean, you know, the whole thing about being a stretch code community and having hers ratings on spec houses can be a marketing tool, also for a builder. It is. Yeah, totally is. You know, a big marketing tool. Yeah. You know, you're gonna buy this house, yeah. and it's gonna perform to this level. It's like a mile per gallon rating. You. Having the, um, the payback, or, or assume be part of that sales pitch, that, that the house be, you know, may be spending a little bit more money on it, but the yeah. payback would be... Can you go back to that slide? Yeah, so these, these cost analysis are great for that because Again, it's tough to see on this slide here. Oh, this propane. Good. Uh, I'm sorry. Use a natural gas one. Yeah, it's electric. It, it's, I keep flipping there everything. Is. Yep. So, uh, again, the estimated cost in you who little building. <laughs> um, if you look, if you looked at the other page, you would see the difference. Is actually 
primarily around the mechanicals and the HVAC equipment that really makes the big difference to move a house from a 62 to a 55 to be compliant to the stretch code. What you look at for like insulation, installation, like how it's installed, it actually looks at how, uh, hers writers look at how the insulation is <coughs> installed. We're agnostic to insulation, and the nice thing on the performance path is I'm sure you've heard this, you can't, you'll hear people all the time, you can't build a home right now in a base code community <coughs> using fiberglass and two by four construction. Like the ways we used to build houses, the code <coughs> today does not allow for that, but the performance path does because you can beef up something and decrease something else. And again, the stretch code and the energy code just focus on energy. You still have to be compliant to the safety aspects of the code, the fire safety, plumbing, and all that stuff, so. Again, uh, I think the education yeah. part of it is, is and I wonder as, as a building inspector, do you have pamphlets? Do you, if someone coming into town and they want to build a house, you get their information as far as who they are and stuff? Is that kind of some information that they can have when they come in to know in case the builder is not given it to them? And well, yeah, we have a whole packet of information that we give to the builders every time somebody comes in with an application. Um, they know immediately that they have to get a HERS rater on board. That's, um, the, that's the builder I'm thinking about. The, the well, well, the homeowner, 90% of the time if the homeowner is going to build up, up he's, he's got an architect involved, and most of the architects are, are up front yeah. with what they need to do. But to answer your question, whether it's a speculative home or whether it's a custom home, they still get the same information from, from my department. We also have all the information from Mass Save relative to the incentives that are available for all the appliances and all the fixtures and, and so on and so forth. So uh, I can't say that, you know, what other towns may do, but, you know, and, and I think the program has helped us generate this because people, people are curious. People want to know, well, if, if we're a stretch code town, what information do you have for me? And, and we have it all to give it to them. Can I just go over this slide real quick to make sure yeah. we all understand this? So this is an example of a 2,200 square foot house, a three bedroom house that's heated by natural gas. Thanks for coming. And what it's saying is that the additional cost is about $2,000. And you get a utility rebate from Mass Safe for that same two thousand dollars. So your net cost is zero, but your first year you're saving an estimated two hundred dollars per year, compounded in energy cost. So in this scenario, which is a real example you guys have done, That's this is honest. again showing that there is no additional cost to. I mean, there is an additional cost, but there's an equal rebate, so there's a net zero cost to the construction, and that you're going to be saving $200 a year thereafter. Yep. And that's essentially the difference between those two HERS ratings? Yep. A 62 right, a 62 and a 55? Yep. And is that, a, is that a linear scale? Pretty close? Yes. Yeah. So that 55 house is more than 10% right more energy efficient than the 62 house and so to, to try to put that into layman's terms like you could reduce your gas and light bill or your energy bills by 10 percent every month by building the the 55 house instead of the 62. is there uh once you live in the greenhouse again my example 2013 house is there some hers or some update that the person can have to come in their house am i really Still energy efficient? Am I, you know, am I well, at the peak? Well, no, but didn't you say that your son's really happy with his house? Oh yeah, yeah. he, he so loves. So that's, I mean, that's it. I mean, I love yeah. it too. Yeah. When it's 95 out, and I go in that house, it's 70 degrees. And when it's cold and windy, it's not cold and draft. No, and he had, we had 30 people for Christmas. So there you have it. I mean, See, I, you're the you're the ad for a stretch code <laughs> house right there. But there's no education. I just came to here tonight, and I told you about my son and his idea of putting on an. We're education. gonna put you in the dock for town meeting. You're gonna have to explain all this to everybody. With a fireplace, the, the problem with this town is they don't educate. So you want to sell something to us? You have to come up with education, pamphlets, or something like that, or somebody who's there. Well, we're here doing this. This is yeah, this is. Here. You're not but we don't. Meeting. But I have 84 cities and towns myself, and there's 351 in the whole state. So this is a local thing. Maybe Just we should invite you no. To so be at town meeting for this no. Meeting. So no, because uh, if we wait till town meeting, it's going to be way too late. Okay. This is an optional program by municipality. 
right? So the town has to be the one. Now we've been here, we've talked about it, we're doing the best we can. But to, I think but, but now people in town are going to have to here's your, here's talk what about I think. it. I went to the, that town meeting on how many years ago it was. We had a builder that stood up. Yeah, they'll do it. And he said very clearly, exactly. and had the, the stretch code was for, once you adopted it, it was for everything. And he clearly got up and told everybody it's clearly that if you put an addition on, it's going to cost more money and all this and all that. And of course it was voted down. But in the, in the recent years now, you've changed it and you've made it more stretch code and it's not... Uh, it's you you, not might, still, you might still hear somebody say that at town meeting, just so you know. You might. Well, we have we had it in Lakeville. Correct. Yeah, you. I mean, you might. You I, mean, I can't. I can't. That look, that's the that's the beauty of living here and having open town government, like we do. You code after you build the home. And but you want that to doesn't mean somebody's change. not going to get up at town meeting and say something different. Yeah. No, no, but it doesn't apply. It's just changed. I mean, that was the crux, I believe, of us saying no, we don't want it because I'm a resident. If I put any changes to my house at that particular time. I would have had to come under the stretch code, but now I don't have to. First of all, even if I had the house built with green, or my current my current house would not comply with that stretch code. So what you can tell people it's so what you can tell people it's Bill? the uh, two thousand savings you were just talking about. Um, two hundred dollars. Huh? Two hundred dollars per year. But the two two thousand dollar rebate. Rebate. Yep. Yep. Two thousand dollar rebate, which would be to the builder, and probably would. That would figure into his price of building the building the house if it was just a spec house, mm -hmm. and ideally you would pass that on to the customer. If it was if there was a customer involved, if he was building the customer, I was building a house for you. Right. I would say you know, you're not going to pay this because it didn't cost. Me. And we don't have many houses on spec in Carver, so it would be a custom-built house that someone's involved in, and yeah. they're going to do the Google, and they're going to want their $2,000 rebate check, or that factored into the final price. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, final yeah. price. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you're only going to build a house that's going to sell in the town. Anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you look at this, this has no impact on our commercial development in town because the only place you can build a 100,000-square-foot building is a new urban renewal plan area. And if you're going to build a building that big anyway, they're going to make it energy efficient, and that's up to some big corporate entity to figure out. But from a residential standpoint, looking at those numbers, there's the additional construction cost is offset by a grant, and then you have a about a 10% savings per year in utilities that goes on in perpetuity as long as your equipment is oh, continues to, to run. Put that on this. Um, yeah, does this apply to uh, the low income housing before the these stuff? Are these same type of code requirements? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Building, building, is yep. building. Any, any but, new which is which is good for people on fixed and limited yeah. incomes because they spend less money on energy costs. And mass mass housing, who's one of the biggest funding of low income and affordable housing, requires com uh, participation in utility incentive programs, which automatically drives you to this because they want you to tap out and tap into as much <coughs> money as out there as possible. You know, conservation seems to be the yeah for conservation than windmills and yeah solar well. Yeah. Well, and you know, if, you, if, you, if you're using the electricity inefficiently, there's really no point in building yeah. wind turbines and, and solar farms. I mean, you're just yeah. wasting it a different, you know, sure. uh, different it's way of generating. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, and, and right now, like, you hear all the time about the grid, the grid, the grid. And the grid in Massachusetts is very old, and our power plants are very old. We have a power plant that's... Plymouth that's getting shut down right now and they're not putting another one up so we're going to continue to put more houses and more infrastructure here and we're going to have less power sources so if you're not going to generate through renewable energy you need to conserve so and I think that's one of the big things. Grid's, we, we grid's, always, grid's not that old here in Cava just so you know yeah. they had a nice big upgrade to the <laughs> substation yeah, boy, up here and I think, feet, they, boy, I think they right didn't they, they upgraded the lines down to the canal from here too. Yeah. I like the idea that it's not uh, additions. That Typically, in towns that where the, there's not a lot of new construction, I was in Douglas last week. I was in Douglas last week. They have they had nine new homes built. I think last year, of which six of them went through the program that I manage, which is a voluntary program, which means that those builders are already exceeding the stretch code. So six out of nine homes, only three of them weren't. And again, we were in Douglas in 2011. They didn't I think the same thing. Didn't make a town meeting. Yeah, 
but majority of the construction in, in Douglas is renovations, additions, a lot of mill building conversions, and mill buildings are historic, so they're exempt from the code regardless. So it's like, now they're like, okay, this makes sense for Douglas now, so let's do it. That's the crux of the point. That was not available. Yeah. When you see all this energy, you know, stuff going, because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, today that houses are first put up, no insulation. <laughs> right. Rags, newspapers, yeah. and yep. walls. And Seaweed. I thought you were going to have corn cobs in mine. Yeah. What? Corn, corn cobs, yeah. 1790. What is it? Corn, corn cobs. cobs. Oh, corn cobs. Oh. <laughs> Corn's gone, but the... So these guys might know better than I. Um, here in Massachusetts, the energy uh, building code gets updated every three years. Um, where it'll be on the so next iteration? Too tight is too tight, or how tight is? Well, so too tight's not going to be allowed because it would be unhealthy. Yep. Yeah. And and a hers rate, hers again, pitch for the performance path or prescriptive is when you're working with a HERS rater, they're gonna tell you how much you have to ventilate your home, so you're not gonna either over or under ventilate it because that energy modeling software tells, tells you how much ventilation you put in by the number of occupants, square footage, things like that. So you're not just guessing, you're actually putting in the right amount of ventilation. Um, but where, but where where, the, where where's the, the code going? So, the ventilation yeah. is it, 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 heat yeah. Some, it, sometimes it, it, it could be a bathroom vent fan rated for constant use could do the job. It all depends on how much ventilation you need by size and by, by occupants. You, uh, you, you don't have to, yeah. so if you're building a brand new house, yep. you don't have to do it that way, but you might choose to do it that like way air based air on air. heat exchanger. Yeah. Yeah. And air air. yeah. yeah. You, I mean, yep. that's, you, might. you could do it, be, or you could just do it, there's many ways to do it. You just have to meet that, yeah, you just mm, have to meet no. that no. button, was that? No, here, was open that? a window. Oh yeah. <laughs> but to answer your question about the, where the codes are going, so we currently not only did the stretch code change on January 1st of this year, but the base code did. So Carver has a new energy code as of January 1st of this year, and that's IECC 2015. IECC 2015 and the stretch code are exactly the same, minus the stretch code not having the prescriptive path. Um, the state of Massachusetts, because of the Green Communities Program and because they want to tap into programs like Green Communities, will continue to adopt the I codes. The next version of the code is coming out 2018 is the next version of this, the base code. It takes one year, if not sometimes longer, yeah, at least, before the code can be adopted. So ICC 2018 will come out. It'll take almost a full year for it to go through public hearings, feedback. You probably know as a builder, we get tons of amendments to the code. It will go through an amendment cycle, things like that. And then they'll have a, a launch date that it will go live. So let's say that might be 2019, <coughs> could be 2020. What we've seen of IECC 2018, it, it's already written, so we already know what it looks like. It looks a lot like the code that we have today uh, in your town with even a little great emphasis on performance testing. So every time this, the energy codes changed, we went from having no performance testing unless you wanted it, to then having the ducks tested, now having the ducks and infiltration testing done so the codes are moving to more performance based outcome based codes then they're moving away from but I think I think you know to, to I, I we talked about it before the meeting gets started um, to, to address I think part of your concern is that there have been some big changes over the last six seven years um, the changes are starting to slow down because there's a rate of diminishing returns um, when you're trying to keep everything right, when you're thinking about economy, you're thinking about the energy efficiency, um, the the air change issues on on basic health. It, it, yep. It's all going to depend on uh, you know technological developments too. I mean, insulation is yep. the right. high density insulation and stuff like that. Nowadays, if something more efficient and the same cost, and yeah. I mean, how you know, thinking of building a house or an addition, there's only Right, yeah. and I think that's what we're seeing is we're seeing a slight pumping of the brakes of the codes right now because as you just, exactly what I was going to say was technology has to catch up to the codes and the availability of technology and so when you're looking at that HERS index scale and cost, we're going from, we're going to a HERS 55 and you're moving down the scale to net zero construction. There are states like California. Um, I think two other states off the top of my head, I can't remember, but definitely California are looking to adopt net zero building codes. But you have to have, in order to be net zero, you have to have on-site generation. And again, there's not enough 
there's not enough land people have to put up wind turbines there's not enough roof sometime to put up solar so I think we as an industry as codes are adopted I think that we have to kind of wait to catch up so 2018 looks a lot like 2015 the code we have today and I think that was on purpose because that's going to give six to seven to eight years potentially that the code will remain somewhat similar before it moves to the not, next. Just not as big a change as yeah. incrementally. I mean, yeah. there was a big change. We, yeah, we were it's leaps and bounds. Be affordable for right. Company. Yep. Right. Yep. And, and I and I think you can get there now by adding in better insulation because there is good insulation out there. There's some great windows out there. Mechanical equipment has made incredible yeah, strides. Difference. So those things make a huge difference right now, but. The next big thing is going to be, you know, who knows, like what's going to drive homes, right. you know. So I think we're fortunate. But with that being said, the base code is is very similar. The stretch code is very similar to the base code. The difference with towns that have the base code and have the stretch code is grant funding. Right. So you either adopt the stretch code and and, and tap into the grant funding, or you don't. And, but you're not eligible for the grant funding. You're not a green community. That was your question. I had the grant money. It is it is specific for energy conservation things yeah to start to start here in town we would be looking to um, basically you know exhaust every single uh, uh, energy efficiency opportunity possible in all of your existing structures that could use it so like is it identifying the energy yeah need yeah we the right. grant is granted? Uh, yeah yes. yeah so there'd be yeah there'd be a five-year plan yep so we would baseline the whole town's energy usage um, probably not including the new school, may probably not including the, the new public safety building, um, the other stuff, and then we would come up with a plan over a five-year period that would try to reduce that baseline by 20%. So I don't know what the energy, you know, I don't know what the energy budget is here in town, but that can be a significant amount of money every year if you can do it. Oh, yeah. It's 100 grand of 20%. Yeah. So... So we good? <laughs> Th I'd like to thank everybody yeah. for coming. Sir, do you have any questions car. in the back? No, actually, I think it was that Helen pretty much asked everything I've ever been Okay. All right. She and all the bases. And I'd especially like to thank Jim for coming. Yeah. Because he came on definitely. his own time. Um, and uh, we really appreciate it, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I